I thank the members for their vision, their imagination, especially Ms. Chia Yang Yong's uh, heartfelt plea. We are living amidst an accelerating digital revolution, and this is a revolution of a much greater intensity and scale than the previous revolution that we have lived through. And there will be profound changes, changes to the way we do business, the way we live, the way we interact, the way we mobilize, the way we socialize, politics, and the way we interact with each other as well. But let me start with a more serious note. It is also going to disrupt jobs. It's going to disrupt even hitherto safe middle class white collar work. And it will impact wages. It will also initially increase inequality because the people and the companies, and I may add the nations, that master the technology first, the new digital oligarchs, these people and these companies will have enormous reach because their market is the entire world. Our political challenge is to democratize these new technologies so that it empowers all citizens to harvest the opportunities in this brave new world and thereby to spread the fruits of this harvest more broadly. If you think about it, this disruption is already happening all around us. Take finance as an example. There are already artificial intelligence bots which trade on the stock market, which trade funds. And these AI engines can look through far more data than a human being can, can make hopefully more unbiased assessments, can improve their learning algorithms over time, and they can conduct trades in milliseconds. The same thing is happening in surgery, and similar things are happening in legal and accounting professions. And so the top priority for smart nation has to be jobs, jobs, jobs. In Singapore, protectionism and building walls is not a recipe for protecting jobs. So our only option is to ensure that our people and our businesses have the skills needed for the digital economy. You've heard DPMTO just now explain to you that even within government, we have an urgent need for new specialists in areas like cybersecurity, data analysis, software development, user interface, user experience designers, and network engineering. If you take the private sector, take Garena, which is probably one of our largest unicorns in Southeast Asia, founded and headquartered in Singapore. They run a business in digital content, e-payments, and e-commerce. They're expanding rapidly throughout the region, and they urgently need more people. And they need more people with the skills. But we don't just need techies and coders. We need people who can apply tech to the real world to make a real difference in addressing the needs of real people. And I also agree that we need to help our businesses, our enterprises, and especially our SMEs to identify and to adopt the new technologies in order to make them more competitive. And this is something which we will have to work through the ITMs, the industry transformation maps, because each industry will have its own specific needs. And it's not a tech issue, it's an application of tech challenge. Minister Jakob will share our progress in this and how we intend to build up the talent pipeline so that our SMEs and our large local enterprises will have the talent that they so need. The second thing is that we need to build more integrated digital platforms. You notice I use the word integrated. I've heard the calls for more integrated government. And these platforms must provide us with the capabilities that enable innovation, that benefit citizens in a real way and reduce business costs. Let me go through a few examples. One big project we're working on now is on digital identity. Digital identity, or the authentication of digital identity, is actually a very difficult challenge. And yet, if you think about it, it is absolutely essential if we are going to have secure transactions in the digital world. I'm glad to report that one of our own homegrown companies, Viki, has quietly actually been providing this technology, a very novel, interesting technology, to a wide range of companies ranging from DBS to Alibaba. It works behind the scenes. If you think about what we currently use today, we've got SingPass. To be honest with you, it's not good enough. And 
Yet today we use SingPass to file our income tax. In fact, for so many of our government interactions depend on SingPass. We need to quickly upgrade this and we need to make sure that it is good enough as a secure digital identification system. And I want, I've asked the team to look at three features in the short term. One, to include biometric elements. Two, to enable encryption. And three, to have open API so that SingPass is not something only used for government, but that the infrastructure behind that is available to the private sector as well. We need to do all this in order to engender greater confidence, to reduce transaction costs, to allow information to be exchanged securely and seamlessly to create new services and to improve customer experience. Now, the point is we can provide these platforms, but we actually have to enable our companies to ride on these platforms to derive a competitive advantage. Another area we're working on in the next year is on e-payments. And I've heard the calls, you know, with too many cards. We've all got too many cards. And sometimes incompatibility. It's really irritating, really inconvenient. Today, we've got contactless credit cards. We've got mobile payments. We've got uh, telephone, smartphone payments. Uh, and I agree with you. There's a proliferation of mobile apps as well. But yet, a very simple thing, like transferring funds from me to you securely and without cost is not so easy to do. For instance, if I wanted to transfer to you, I need to know your bank account number. We are working with industry to roll out a central addressing scheme, which will better enable or facilitate digital cash transfers. This works like a register which maps mobile numbers to bank account numbers, or to the unique entity number of businesses. So you can look forward to being able to use your existing mobile or internet banking service to send funds to friends if you all, the only thing you need to know is their phone numbers. And even if they have accounts in different banks. I know I'm standing right in front of Mr. Liang, and I know DBS already has PayLa, but I want this to be open to everyone. The, I also agree with Ms. Ching Li Hui's concern about the proliferation of payment modes. And I agree that there's scope for consolidation. But I believe we should consolidate at the infrastructure level, at the platform level, at the back office level, to enable compatibility. But we don't need consolidation at the front office, the retail level, the front, the customer facing side, because we want competition and we want choice for the customers. But we need interoperability so that it becomes convenient, there are lower barriers to entry, and it is secure. So we need to work on this duality. We believe that having a central addressing scheme is one way to get a move on with e-payments in Singapore. We've actually been too slow in this area. Similarly, some of you may notice if you go to retail points now that there's a unified point of sale terminal. This terminal is a Pao Kaliao thing. It can read all kinds of cards, all different technologies, including magnetic strips, EMV strips, and NFC chips. We are taking a similar approach for transport, and we are piloting account-based ticketing. Commuters can use their contactless MasterCard and not just have to find the right easy link card for travel. And if this is successful, we will bring this on board with bringing other payment providers as well. Again, to make it easier, to make it more convenient. For government apps, I take the point that we want platform unification, and we don't but I'm not sure we need everyone to use the mother of all apps. In fact, I've told the government departments that if someone else from the private sector comes up with a better and more effective app that makes available government services, we should encourage that. We should not allow the government to have a monopoly on app production to access government services. Another example is that we also need to get away from agency-centric approach. You know, there's an LTA app, an NEA app, and so on and so forth. We have to look at it to a more citizen-centric model. And one way that MOF is looking at is to group them by milestones. When you are born, what services do you need? When you have a child, or when you go to hospital, or when you work, you know, there are moments in life, and we can cluster these services, make it more citizen-centric rather than agency centric. Another thing which we're working on, in fact PM has been pushing, is this concept of open data. Government has lots and lots of data. 
including real-time data down to the location of every single bus and taxi. We want to make this data available for free for everyone. And let me give you some examples. If you are on Facebook and you go to Messenger, search for this chatbot called Bus Uncle. It's not written by government. It was written by someone who, was, who didn't like the interface for bus arrival times. So this is a, a chatbot. You just send a message. It will tell you when the bus is coming. And it does it in a very quirky Singaporean way. Go and check, check that out. But actually, the real interesting thing about this chatbot is the fact that beneath it, it is accessing real-time LTA data for free. This is an example where providing government data and having open data and allowing the private sector to ride on top of it creates a whole new level of services that we could not have imagined or could not have delivered with such style. In fact, today, public transport data is downloaded about 16 million times a day. And most of this by commuters who are checking bus arrival times on their apps. By freeing data, we believe that we will enable both businesses and citizens to innovate, to develop new products that will serve their own needs. So I think we can still allow proliferation at the front end, at the top end. But let's create common platforms and open data underneath that. I'll give you another example from today. Uh, this is being launched by Grab. They're launching Grab Shuttle. I'm afraid it's another app, or maybe it's another side feature of their app. Um, what this does is that it allows commuters to crowd start their new routes. You can pre-book seats on 15 selected routes, and these are identified using data from a crowd starting platform developed and provided by GovTech. Um, you can use this to enable private bus operators to use the same analytics to improve their fleet management and operations, including the tracking, the punctuality of drivers. The real issue is this. Private transport is point to point. Public transport is hub to hub, and then you have a last mile issue. If you can make it smart, public transport can be revolutionized to be point to point, responsive, and in real time. That is how we can get a revolution to make public transport the preferred mode of, trans of transport and how we can get higher throughput without increasing our roads to more than the 12% of land that they already take. So this is another example where we need to push harder and faster. Now, while we do all this, make data available, allow people to ride on it, allow new programs, have e-payments, digital identity, do not forget that cybersecurity is an absolute prerequisite. And our critical control systems need to be protected even as they make them smart. And you just heard the recent breach in the MINDEF system. I hope this now emphasizes the point that when we decided to have internet segregation of the public service, it was absolutely the right decision. Because otherwise, that breach could potentially have led to breaches of internal control and secure systems. But I can, rest, I can assure you that our civil servants still continue to be able to surf the net. For instance, in my ministry, we have ensured that wireless at SG is pervasive throughout the building. Everyone can continue to surf on their tablets, their phones, or on a separate computer. So civil servants are not cut off from the internet. I think we need to bear in mind the fact that we need a renewed sense of urgency to uncover new possibilities, to work across bureaucratic boundaries, and to be willing to disrupt ourselves. Let me give you another example from land use planning. You know this is complex, and from time to time you come up here and you give speeches about how you know, there are missing gaps in covered walkways and so on and so forth because different people own different pieces of land. Many agencies are involved in this. Now, I believe that the old way of coordination in a top-down fashion, although it can be facilitated to some extent by email, is still not an optimal way of organizing it. URA developed ePlanner, a one-stop digital portal that aggregates large volumes of geospatial data. And it supports planners from 25 different partner agencies who can now 
collectively access and analyze land use planning information and to make decisions objectively on the basis of data, not on the basis of opinion. This has transformed land use planning within government. We also intend to make sure that we can serve the public better, faster and cheaper. Another example is in June last year, URA revamped the URA space, which is an online map portal, consolidates detailed land use information, including private property related information. One example of an e-service is that it allows businesses to check the allowable and approved users for private shop houses. In the past, you would have had to fill up a form, send it in, wait seven days for a response. Today, with this portal, the answer is instantaneous and my favorite word, free. Not many cities in the world can do this because it involves intense integration at the back end. We need more examples like this. In the digital world, if you think about it, the short run marginal cost, different from long run marginal cost, the short run marginal cost of serving the next customer trends towards zero. Whether you serve one or you serve a million, your marginal costs have not gone up, but your unit cost goes down considerably. So we need our public agencies to systematically eliminate application forms, streamline processes, streamline information flows. That is the way we can reduce fees for routine services by working smarter. I also totally agree with Ms. Chia Yang Yong, um, Zaki Mohammed, I think Dr. Teo Ho Pin also said yesterday on the need for digital inclusion, especially for the elderly and especially for the disabled. We are not far away from the day, Yong Yong, when you will walk in here with an exoskeleton perhaps. But we can, if there's a place that we can start, it should be Singapore. And homes, we are piloting remote home monitoring solutions in places like Yihua, Marine Parade, and Bidok. This will allow family care or caregivers to be able to monitor the activity, the security, the health of seniors, and have peace of mind. We're also promoting the use of assistive technologies. We have set up TechAble in the enabling village. I think you might be familiar with it. This is a one-stop resource center on assistive te uh, technologies and devices for people with disabilities, for caregivers, for therapists, and for social service professionals. TechAble has reached out to about 3,000 people thus far. MOE also provides dedicated funding for special ed schools to procure computer facilities, courseware, and other assistive technology. We will also focus on in digital inclusion in our community centers. You've heard about the Silver Infocom Initiative, and this is a way, even if people don't own any smartphone, can't use technology, we have to handhold, train, provide, so that everyone can ride on this. Finally, let me answer this question on what sets us apart. What is our unique selling point or competitive advantage? I believe we are approaching this from a position of strength. We continue to offer one of the best digital infrastructures in the world. Second, our people are well-educated, well-trained, and tech-savvy. Third, we have only a single layer of government. And we have a PM who can code, a PM who certainly gets it, who is a mystery customer on many government websites and many, uh, and you know, if it's a complaint, it's usually, all, especially a smart complaint, it's almost always the prime minister. The key here is that it's not just tech innovation, but policy innovation and the spirit of internal disruption and a willingness to rewrite regulations, absorb ideas, and another thing which we want to do different is to feed our own startups by buying their services and to be a test bed for novel solutions, for urban solutions, and especially including in areas like fintech, transport, healthcare, home care, and social services. So to conclude, we need to urgently build skills and capabilities in our people and enterprises. We need to ensure pole position with the best infrastructure in the world. We need to be prepared to fundamentally disrupt the way government provides services. We need to forge new partnerships with the private sector. We need to make sure our startups especially have access to technology and opportunities. And we need to be open 
to the global flow of talent and ideas. Ultimately, this is not about technology, but really about maximizing future job options and ensuring a better quality of life and an inclusive society. Our vision is that a visitor to Singapore should come, look, experience, and say, I have seen the future and it works.